I actually don't feel well. This is a sentence that my wife said to me a few weeks ago. And I said, what do you mean? And she's like, I don't know. I've just been coughing and sneezing a lot. And I just feel really kind of tired lately. And that was the day we decided to stay in opposite ends of the house. I actually slept in a different bedroom, and so she went and got tested right away. And when the results came back, she tested positive for COVID-19, which is a little bit of a big deal because I'm considered high risk. I have a compromised immune system. And uh, so then I went and I got tested, and my results came back negative, and she said, you have to get out. You have to leave. So, uh, what, do you, what do you mean? This is my house. I live here. So you need to go. You need, you need to find some place else to stay. I was like, where am I going to go? So, I don't know. You need to figure it out. And uh, I said, I don't want to leave. And she said, I don't want you to leave either. But I would rather you leave for two weeks than you get it, be gone, and leave forever. Which actually made sense. She's a smart one, this one. She was thinking with the end in mind, which is exactly what Jesus does in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7. Last week, we started a new series called The End in Mind. And Pastor Marty did a brilliant job in bringing us into thinking about judging others. If you remember, recently Jesus spoke cryptically about eyes, good eyes and bad eyes. This was a Hebrew idiom. So when a Jewish speaker talked about a good eye, it was a figure of speech. A good eye meant that one was generous, and a bad eye meant that one was stingy. So what is it? What is it that keeps us from being generous? Worry. Worried that if we're generous with our time, our talent, and our treasure, that perhaps there won't be enough left over for us. That's why Pastor Marty talked about this at length weeks ago. Remember, don't worry, be happy. Worry cripples our ability to be generous. Worry gives us a bad eye. That's why Jesus invites us to trust. Trust that he has our best interest at mind. He invites us to trust in the story. Last week, Jesus again talks cryptically about these eyes, this time about planks and specks, and apparently this time he seems to be obsessing over pigs and pearls and dogs. Remember, we read about this, right? And Jesus says, don't give to dogs what is holy. So apparently, I shouldn't feed the Bible to my golden retriever. And then he says, Don't cast your pearls before swine, which is kind of a funny text, but we read it, and so apparently God's not happy with me right now. Here, buddy. Hungry? Here you go. Have some more. Here, bud. See, the problem with this is that I wasn't really tempted to do this in the first place. So what is Jesus actually talking about? The pagan nations were often referred to as dogs. This wasn't derogatory. This is just another figure of speech. And as much as they were referred to as dogs, they also would have referred to as pigs or swine. Not derogatory, just the second largest export outside of grain. And even pearls themselves were often used to refer to the rabbinic teachings. There's even phrases about stringing pearls together. See, the rabbi teachings, they stacked one on top of another. And so Jesus says, you cannot take your morality and throw it onto people who never agreed to follow it. It doesn't make any sense. Duh, right? I mean, but we do it all the time. We love, we love to talk about our views on right and wrong and left and right and righteousness and morality. Then we're shocked. I mean, we're completely obliterated and our expectations are blown away when, when somehow we're surprised when the world ends up acting like the world. And Jesus says you can't take these precious pearls, these teachings that you have, you can't take them and throw them to the swine and expect them to enjoy it. 
you actually could probably expect just the opposite. They will trample it and they will turn on you. But all that was last week. Right? All that was last week having nothing to do with what we're covering this week. I mean, that was judgment and generosity and worry. And those things have nothing to do with each other. They're all separate, right? By the way, when Jesus talks about judgment, last week what we learned was that he says you are not free to determine the value of another human being. Only God can do that. A mere mortal cannot decide the worth of another. But we do it all the time, don't we? Why? Why do we judge people? Why do we cast judgment? Whether it's big or small, we do it all the time without even thinking about it, we judge people. Why do we cast judgment on others? What's the opposite of judgment? Forgiveness. So maybe a better question may be, why don't we forgive people? Because we're worried they won't get what they deserve. Is that word again? Worry, judgment, generosity. Perhaps all these things aren't completely separate. Perhaps they are intertwined. Perhaps they're all connected in some way, shape, or form. As a matter of fact, it would make a lot of sense to see this next teaching that Jesus gives us as a complete brilliant tie back into everything that he's been talking about since he started the Sermon on the Mount. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, and your notebooks, you may turn to Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 7, picking up where we left off from last week. It says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Really? Is Jesus really proposing that our wish is his command? Any request that we make known to God, he will answer all of our prayers? Can we really take Jesus up on such an open-ended promise? My little sister was five years old. That would have made me about ten. And my dad told my sister that she could have whatever she wanted from Toys R Us. Rest in peace the greatest toy store ever. And so as the older brother who was kind to his little sister like you are, I told her, this is what you need. It's called Power Wheels. (laughs) You need a battery-operated motorized car that can take you wherever you want to go. I mean, you can't go on the highway, but in the neighborhood, anywhere you want to go. This is what you need. You need to tell dad this is what you want, and you will come home with your own car. And so when she came home with my dad, they pulled up with a bright pink rubber ball coming at a grand total of $4.99. Stupid. What a wasted opportunity. Now, was I trying to get my sister to buy the most expensive thing in the store? Absolutely, and don't judge me because any one of you would have done the same thing. We all know of times when generosity can be taken advantage of. I mean, we have the caricature in our mind of the person who asks God for outlandish things in order to help feed their self-indulgence. Maybe for you, a televangelist in a Rolls Royce with an air-conditioned doghouse is what comes to mind. You see, over the years, there was a different gospel that emerged. And how many of you know that a different gospel is no gospel at all? Some people call it name it, claim it. It's a prosperity gospel. And the teachers of this prosperity gospel teach their students to ask, to pray for, even demand from God materialistic possessions. One teacher says when you ask God for these things, he has to give them to you. It's the one way we as Christians get ahead in life. The problem with this idea, the problem with this theology is that it reduces God down to the idea of a genie in a bottle that works at the commands of his creation. The Bible actually warns against this. In James chapter four, it says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. You ask for your own selfish passions. I would propose to us today that our problem Our problem is not that we are too eager to ask for the wrong things, but that we're not eager enough to ask for the right things. 
Not that we're too eager to ask for the wrong things, but not eager enough to ask for the right things. One of the most ingenious things about Jesus is that he enlightens his relationship with us to the relationship between a parent and a child. He tells this parable right in the next few verses, and it goes like this. Or which one of you, if his sons ask for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Jesus, the Son of God, says, if you then who are evil... Ouch. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? He says, if your kid asks for bread, are you going to give him a pile of rocks? If your kid asks for fish, are you going to give him a live snake on a plate? No. If you who are evil, if you who are flawed, if you who are not me, the Son of God who is perfect in every way, if you who are flawed and sinful know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does the Father in heaven know how to give good gifts to his children who ask? He tells this story. He gives this idea. And the idea is that you have this child and this child asks you for good things. You're glad that your child asks you for good things. You like the fact that your child is hardwired to be dependent upon you. Your child is hungry and they ask you for food and you're happy to give it to them. Your child asks to go outside and play ball with you. You're excited to play catch with your son or maybe even your daughter. Your child grows up and goes through a difficult time and they ask you for advice. You like this, but what happens when your child stops asking you for good things? You might think that something's wrong. You might even be hurt by this. So is God. God delights in the fact that we are dependent upon him so that when you stop asking God for good things, you become like a child who has a negative or cynical outlook on their parent. You end up with your actions saying things like, I don't want anything. I don't need anything from you. I'm going to do this all on my own. I don't want you. I'm going to do it myself. You become a runaway. Don't be a runaway. Or maybe your child asks you for things and you're not sure if they're good things, right? Your, your, your child asks to uh, have the pack of bubble gum that stares at them in the grocery line at the checkout, right? Or your child asks to borrow the car before they're ready, Or maybe your child asks to spend the night at a friend's house that you're just a little, eh, about. You know that because you've been there. It is the sole responsibility of the parent to determine and decide what is a good thing and what is not a good thing. And the proper timing for it. Don't hold back from asking God for good things. Keep the end in mind in your prayers. When it comes to your prayer life, keep the end in mind. As you mature in your relationship with God and in your spirituality, you will increasingly more and more share God's concern with the suffering that is in this world. Last month, uh, we installed some wainscoting in our home. Uh, most of you probably know what that is. If you don't, it's basically wood paneling. It goes from the floor up about three feet, usually white, and then there's a trim piece that goes above it. It's called chair rail. That chair rail comes in about 10-foot length pieces, and, uh, which is great and hard to get home, but the first time we're doing a wall that's, um, I'm sorry, it comes in eight feet pieces, and the first time we were doing a wall that's a 10-foot piece, I was like, we have an issue here. I'm not really sure, but we'll cut another piece of two feet, and which sounds great, but when you put it up on the wall, you see a seam where one ends and one begins, which apparently is not attractive to the eye, and so I pick up some wood filler, and the idea is you put wood filler in between the crack, let it dry overnight, and then sand it down the next day, and you're good to go. You can't see the seam. And uh, this sounds really good in theory. The problem is, this is very difficult material to work with. 
I mean, first of all, it's like squeezing Play-Doh through a toothpaste tube. It's the hardest thing in the world. And then you get some out, and you try to, I'm trying to smush it into the crack, just get it in there, but it sticks to your finger and not to the wood, and it's all stringy and gets all over the place, and it's completely messy. It's gross and disgusting. You have to be like a straight-up artist in order to work with this stuff properly. God is like an artist working with difficult material. And one of the ways that this material cooperates with the artist is through prayer. That's why it's important to keep the end in mind when you pray. Because as you mature in your relationship with God, as you mature in your spiritual walk with Jesus, you'll look at a passage like this and no longer ask, does this really mean I get everything I want? But you'll be shook and you'll be moved that there is a God in heaven who's ready and willing to work with difficult material like you. So when you pray, what do you ask for? What are the kind of things that you ask for? Do you pray for you? Do you pray for others? Is there a way that through your prayers you could begin to more cooperate with the artist. And Jesus doesn't stop there. He actually goes on. And the next verse, verse 12, he says, so whatever. So this is in light of everything that we've just talked about. Ask, seek, knock. Ask. Asking is good because it reveals your dependence upon God. Seek. Seek is good because it takes that dependence upon God and marries it to his will. And then knock. This is good because it builds up perseverance, which Paul talks about and says is very good. Ask, seek, knock. All that we just covered. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law of the prophets. Now, With this, Jesus was not the first to say this. I mean, it says right here, this sums up the law of the prophets. So the prophets of old said this before Jesus, and it was passed down for many generations even before the prophets. It's the oldest thing that you have ever learned. Probably even before preschool, you were told to treat others the way that you want to be treated. This is a guide for behavior. That's what this is about. It sums up the law of the prophets. But it's not just treat others the way that you want to be treated. This isn't reactionary. It's not reacting to your surroundings. This is an imperative. Go and do. You be the first one to do it. What do you want to be treated with? Treat people with that first. So Erica and I have different love languages. If you know us closely, you'll be really surprised by that, I'm sure. Um, My love language is physical touch, apparently. And her love language is quality time. They are not very close in similarities. So... When we were first married in an apartment in California, when Erica would come home, uh, I wanted to show her love. So I showed her love the way that I would want to receive love. I met her at the front door with a big smile on my face, showing that I was happy to see her, and my arms open wide, ready to give her the biggest hug she had ever received in her entire life because I wanted her to know that she's loved. When she walked through the door, she didn't see love, she saw a threat. There was nowhere to run, no escape, she was trapped. And conversely, sometimes when we're on the sofa, opposite ends of the sofa, she can be writing a paper and I'm reading a book or watching a movie and she can just feel like, oh, this is so good to spend quality time together. I just feel so loved. This is what, and I'm like, we haven't said a word to each other in an hour and a half. I don't understand, I don't, I don't understand, I don't, I, I, I don't get this, you know, like, I could really use a hug right now. <laughs> <laughs> Two different love languages, right? Usually you show love the way that you want to receive love. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. Not necessarily by your own love language, but if you want to receive love, then show love. If you want people to be kind to you, be kind to them first. If you want people to be gentle with you, be gentle with them. If you want people to be generous with their thoughts about you, be generous with your thoughts about them. If you want people to give you the benefit of the doubt, then give them the benefit of the doubt. And don't wait for them to react to you. You do it first. You give it to them first. 
Don't hold back from being generous with your thoughts towards other people. Don't hold back from giving people the benefit of the doubt. Keep the end in mind when it comes to your behavior. Keep the end in mind when it comes to your behavior towards others. If you did, if you kept the end in mind with your behavior, if you treated others first the way that you wanted to be treated, how would it change your world? Or better yet, how would it change someone else's? Jesus talks about these two teachings and then he kind of dives into this, this warning. This warning in the next verses, verses 13 and 14, it says this, enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. In the old walled city of Jerusalem, there are many gates and some have roads that lead up to them where cars can kind of come to and fro. Um, who says that? To and fro. I just realized how ridiculous that sounded. Cars can come in and out. And then uh, some have very steep steps where only pedestrians can, and small animals can kind of come in and out. We were in Jerusalem about a year ago, and we got to see some of these gates. The people that Jesus is talking to in this passage would have been familiar with many cities and towns just like this. And at these gates, uh, some are wide enough for people, multiple people to come in and out uh, to go to and fro, uh, back and forth. And uh, it's just in my head now. And uh, some, you have to wait your turn. Like a one-lane bridge, one person in, one person out. The gate is that small. And these gates are still there today. And Jesus debunks the idea that you can simply just go with the flow and allow the crowd to determine the pace and the direction. You've got to be intentional. We live north of the church on Route 59, and uh, a lot of people live south of the church, which I'm actually really jealous of because they can just turn right and go home. Uh, living north of the church is, does have its benefits. Uh, we're always going against traffic, which is a good thing, um, because when people are leaving in the morning to go to work during rush hour, they're going north up 59 to get the 88, right? And uh, um, I'm not. I'm coming south to come to the church, and there's no traffic. And conversely, when people are coming home from work in rush hour, they are coming from 88 headed south on Route 59, and I'm not. I'm headed north, no traffic. The caveat is I have to turn left out of the church. This can be very difficult, especially during rush hour, because as I come up uh, the, the same entrance that you may have today, I have to turn left, and there are three lanes coming down this busy highway called Route 59, and during rush hour, there is no break, and even if an elderly woman is nice enough to pause and hold up lines and miles of traffic behind her to let me go, she doesn't realize that there are two other lanes of traffic and a semi coming at 60 miles an hour waiting to take off my front end. So I have to wave her on and I never get out. But by the miracle that I do get out because three lanes of traffic are open for a split second and my life may or may not have been in danger, I then have to wait to make sure that the next fourth lane of traffic going the opposite direction is safe enough to merge into so that I can start driving 45 miles an hour in three seconds. If I have to stop at the hardware store on the way home to pick up a light bulb or a tool, it's over. It's all over. Because now I have to cross over three lanes of traffic coming down at rush hour, merge into the next one safely, and I have exactly five seconds to get over three lanes of traffic so that I can turn, turn uh, uh, just, just right safely into Lowe's parking lot. And it is nothing short of a miracle if that happens. If it does, I have to be extremely intentional. I have to be laser beam focused. I need to have eyes everywhere in all directions, watching every mirror, making sure I can see everything and making executive decisions, making sure I'm not putting my life or anybody else's in danger and merge over and it just has to happen this way because narrow is the path that leads to Lowe's parking lot <laughs> and only few find it. But wide is the road with three lanes of traffic that leads North 59 up to Fox Valley. And many 
enter through it. The, the interesting thing about this section of scripture, about this passage, is that Jesus doesn't liken this to salvation. And a lot of times people think that. Some scholars say that because of the context, he's actually not referring to salvation. It's actually just the opposite. It's not something distant and far away. It's something here and now. He's referring to life and destruction here today. He's referring to the narrow gates here today. The point of this is is, is not to show um, how many people get into heaven. The point of this is to show at what ease these two decisions and choices come. Because one comes with great ease and one comes with not great ease. This was never meant to show how many, how few people make it to heaven, but how many, many, many people make it to hell. It was about choices. To choose between two different gates Choose between two different roads. Choose between coming two different kinds of disciples. Don't hold back in making good, right, wise choices. Be wise about your decisions. Keep the end in mind when it comes to your choices. Knowing God matters. Following Jesus matters. See, heaven is just not just some future destination. No, heaven is alive right here and now, and it's among us. There, there, is, there are future destinations, and the choices you make right here and now are shaping yours. So based on the choices that you make every single day, the ones you don't even pay attention to, what kind of future are you shaping? One with God or one without? So my wife kicked me out of the house. She's like, you have to, like, like a woman who was bitten from the undead, afraid she was going to turn at any moment. She was like, you have to get out now. You just need to leave. But I was like, I don't, where am I going to go? I have no place to go. She said, I don't need to stay with a friend. Do it. So that's what I did. I stayed at a friend's house, and, uh, um, which is fine. He and his wife have like five guest bedrooms, a finished basement, and it's just, it, it was, he, he, he actually made me stay in the basement the first day just to make sure that I was okay, which I totally get. I'm totally fine with that. Um, the worst part was when I would have to drive a half an hour to come back to my house, either to retrieve some medication that my wife would leave for me on the front porch, or when I would bring her food, and I also would leave that on the front porch, and then I would text her after I left. I felt like I worked for Uber Eats. And uh, there, was, there, there was one time that... Uh, um, she caught me and I caught her uh, in the dining room window. And she was there with uh, uh, my dog, too, our, our dog, Golden Retriever. His name's Charlie. And uh, I just, I stared at my wife and she, in her weakness, raised her hand with this kind of meek wave. And uh, her face said, I don't want to be alone anymore. And then I look down at my dog, <laughs> so stupid. I look down at my dog and I can hear him whimpering, right? Like they do, mm, mm, like that thing, right? And his face, if he could talk, looks like it would say, I don't understand, why is he leaving? How come he doesn't love us anymore? And then I look back at my wife and her eyes just look so sad. And not much can get me, but my wife can, because she has my heart. And at that moment, uh, I know that we're both fighting back emotion as we stare at each other through triple pane glass, like she has some kind of leprosy. And so I turn away, and I walk back to my car, and I actually start to cry. This is so dumb. I cry and I tell myself, it's only two weeks. It's only two weeks. 
Friends, we are here for a blip on the radar screen of eternity. If you were to take the Bible and take out where it doesn't talk about sin, you would rip out the first two chapters of Genesis and the last two chapters of Revelation and everything else would be left. We live for one brief moment in between those pages. Heaven is not just another place. Heaven is another realm. The Bible does not end with us floating up into heaven. We don't believe in some sort of disembodied evacuation where we have to get out of here and go someplace else. The Bible doesn't end with us floating up into heaven and sitting on a cloud and playing a harp forever. The Bible ends with heaven crashing into earth and it says that he will make all things new. And so the point is not to get into heaven. The point is to get heaven here. To live with the end in mind is not about escaping this world. It's about becoming actively involved in it. It's not about cutting yourself off from your present reality. It's about stepping into it even more fully. It's the difference between the cross having done something for you and the cross having done something in you. The Bible says that he will make all things new. And so that's the point, to be used by God to make all things new, to help restore this place back to the way that it was created to be. And so when I pulled into the driveway and I knew that I would be staying at my own house again, I got out of the car with a grin of confidence on my face. I remember it was sunny outside. I grabbed my bag and Justin Bieber's Holy was playing throughout the speakers of the universe in my own mind. And I walked up to the front door every step in slow motion and I knocked and the front door opened slowly. And in slow motion, my golden retriever, Charlie, jumped up on his hind legs and with his front legs like arms wrapped around my arm tightly and he wouldn't let go as if to say, you can't ever leave again, I'm so glad you're home. I dropped my bag and looked up and I saw my wife coming at me with the biggest smile on her face. She looked like she'd never been happier to see me. And she came at me with her arms open wide, ready to give me the biggest hug I had ever received in my entire life. There was nowhere to go. There was no escape. I was trapped. I was home. And it felt, oh, so good. Friends, there will be a time at some point in the future on a much, much higher scale where all of you will be given the opportunity to hear, welcome home. And until then, every single prayer and every single choice matters. So may you walk up into the Toys R Us of life and see all that is at your disposal. May you see that God is better than name it, claim it. God is better than some sort of prosperity gospel. He says, you have been with me the whole time and all that I have is yours. May you be the kind of material that cooperates with the artist May you not hold back from showing generosity towards others. May you go out of your way to show kindness to people before they ever have an opportunity to show it to you. No matter how many lanes of traffic you have to cross over, keep your eye on the prize because heaven is not just some future destination. It's here, now, and among us. Someday heaven will crash into earth and all things will be made new. And we get until then to see bits and pieces of when heaven does touch earth. So may you be people who bring heaven to earth. May you see that your best days are not behind you, but that your best days are ahead of you. And may you live with the end in mind. Would you stand as we pray this? Heavenly Father, we come before you. God, we're so grateful that this Sunday before Thanksgiving, God, your word is sharper than any double-edged sword piercing right through the heart, separating bone and marrow. 
nor today. May we walk away knowing how great you are when we keep the end in mind. May we ask and seek and knock. God, may you help us to show goodness, to be generous with our thoughts towards others, how we wanna be treated. May we bring that to the world first and be the representation of Jesus Christ that you've called us to be. God, may we keep the end in mind in our choices because our choices matter. They shape where we will spend all of eternity and people are always watching our life. Jesus, may we make much of you with our lives. And it's in your name we pray, amen. Would you lift this song up with us? He has done great things, he is doing great things, and he's going to continue doing great things. And he may wanna do something great right here and now. And as a pastor, a lot of people think, how could a loving God send people to a place of eternal punishment where they're tortured over and over and over again? And they describe this kind of God and they say, I don't wanna believe in that kind of God. I said, yeah, neither do I. The funny thing is, is God is so loving, he gives you exactly what you want. So when you're here on this earth and if you're a runaway and you decide that you want nothing to do with God, you reject him, you want nothing from him, and you're going to do this all on your own and all by yourself, God will give you exactly what you want forever and ever and ever and ever. And people think of hell and how it is and fire and pitchforks and demons gnawing at your flesh. And it sounds terrible, but folks, It's far worse than that. Imagine nothing, black, emptiness, no one around, no one to talk to, nothing, just you, and every pain, every sickness that you've ever felt in your entire life. And God, if God is love and all good things come from God, and this is a place separated from God, this is a place separated from any kind of love, any good thing, it's just there forever and ever and ever. It's not punishment, maybe as much as it is God giving you exactly what you want. If you choose to be without him, without every good thing, that's what you get and we call this hell. On the other side, 
if you choose to live this life with God and give him the praise for all of his creation and all that he's done, trying to live hand in hand with Jesus with every decision and every choice that you make on this earth, you don't just float up into a cloud and play a harp forever. It actually sounds pretty boring. Heaven is not just mansions and streets of gold. Heaven is so much better than you could even imagine. It's not anything like you've ever imagined before because he can do far better than anything that you can kook up in your imagination. God is, imagine every good feeling you've ever felt in your entire life, every person that you love and that you're with. Imagine anything that you've ever experienced that just made you feel like you were on cloud nine and you are with the Father of lights the King of glory, the one in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. Heaven is so far better than you could ever imagine. And the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You won't spend eternity in a place called hell. You'll spend eternity with God in the heavenly realm. And you can do that even here today. If that's you and you say, maybe I am a runaway. I know about God, but maybe I've strayed away. And today's the day I'd like to come home. Or perhaps you've never done it. You've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life and you wanna do it today. I wanna pray with you. So if that's you, just raise your hand. I just wanna ask you to be bold. I wanna know who I'm praying for. Yeah, anybody else? Just raise your hand. Yeah, two, three, four, anybody else? Five, anybody else? Six, seven, yeah, I need eight, nine, 10, 11. Yeah. I just wanna ask if everyone would um, repeat, there's nothing magical about these words, but when you mean them in your heart, it changes your whole eternity. So would you join me in this prayer? Just say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for mine. I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And today I announce you and I declare you as the risen Son of God, my Lord, my Savior, in Jesus' name, amen. Heaven, let's give it up for saving grace. Heaven is throwing the biggest party for those 11 people and even you online who prayed that prayer. You're watching from home or from some other place, but that prayer doesn't mean any less because you weren't in this room. It doesn't matter where you are when you pray that prayer. Folks, if you know that prayer, take that prayer to your workplaces, take it to your families this Thanksgiving because it will change the lives of people all over wherever they are in the world. And heaven throws a big party every time someone says yes to Jesus because we've just made heaven that much more crowded. So congratulations to the 11 of you in this room and all of you online that decided to become part of the family of God. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. And may he cause his face to shine upon you. May he give you grace and be gracious to you. And may he give you peace. And may you live with the end in mind. We love you, God bless you, and we will see you next week. 